So tonight's talk is on emptiness. Every time I give this talk, I think, you know, I should tell people this is a rather advanced topic. Uh, I'd probably start out, you know, making sense. And then, yeah, if you don't follow the whole thing, don't, don't sweat it, right? Yeah, I'll put it out there. Hopefully it'll at least make some sense. We'll just see how it goes. So the first question about emptiness, empty of what? Emptiness is a translation of shunyata or sunyata. And it, it means in the Mahayana tradition, empty of any essence. In Theravadan Buddhism, they talk about all things are impermanent, all things are dukkha, all things are without self. But that without self really could be thought of as without any essence, without a unchanging center, something that's gonna be there forever. And this is what the emptiness in the Mahayana is talking about. It's a generalized case of not self. Not only do you not have a self, the table doesn't have a self, and the sun doesn't have a self, and the universe doesn't have a self. They're all empty. And we'll take a look at what that's like. Now, as I said, this is the Mahayana view, but the basis of the Mahayana view can be found in a sutta in the connected discourses, the uh, Samyutta Nikaya. It's the sutta I think is the most profound of all. I'll read you what it says. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was living at Savati. And there the venerable Kachyana Gota approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. Okay, so this is being given to the venerable Kachyana Gota. It's not just some monk. It's a monk with some degree of standing. And this gives us a hint that this might be a more advanced teaching. Sitting there, he said to him, Venerable sir, it is said, right view, right view. In what way, venerable sir, is there right view? This world, Kachyana, for the most part, depends upon a duality, upon the notion of it is and the notion of it is not. It's translated here as the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. But for one who sees the origin of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. And for one who sees the cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no notion of existence with regard to the world. So if you see the world arising, you don't think it's not there. And if you see things in the world disappearing, you don't think it exists, it is there. The extremes, the notions, the duality of existence and non-existence is basically the way we look at reality. We put anything, is Santa Claus existence or non-existent? I could, I could, you know, do a survey of you. What do you think? Santa Claus existent or non-existent? Well, if you say he's non-existent, then the next time you have a three-year-old who's misbehaving, all you got to do is say, Santa Claus is watching and boom, non-existent Santa Claus just caused some uh, better behavior, right? And of course, Santa Claus rises, rides at the end of the Christmas parades, when they have Christmas parades, and he sells Coca-Cola. So non-existent Santa Claus seems to have a whole lot of existence going on. I mean, I bet there's a lot more people in this country that know Santa Claus's name than know your name, right? He's a lot more famous than you are, and he doesn't even exist. Or does he exist? 
the notion of existence and non-existence, well, sometimes it's useful, but sometimes it's a little shaky there. And the Buddha is saying this world for the most part depends on that duality. So he wants us to take a look at it in a slightly different way. This world, Katyana, is for the most part shackled by engagement, clinging, and adherence. This world is shackled by views and opinions. But this one with right view does not become engaged and cling through that engagement and clinging, mental standpoint, adherence, underlying tendency. One with right view does not take a stand about my self my soul, my atta. So the question always is arising, is there a self or is there not a self? Does the self exist? Does the self not exist? I think I mentioned Bhachagota comes to the Buddha and wants to know, Venerable Sir, once and for all, is there a self? And the Buddha doesn't answer. And then Bhachagota asks, well, Venerable Sir, is there no self? And the Buddha doesn't answer. He's not going to be drawn into saying it exists or it doesn't exist. Vajikota leaves and Ananda asks him, Venerable Sir, why didn't you answer the wanderer Vajikota? If I had told him there was a self, would that be consistent with what I've been teaching in the past? No, Venerable Sir. If I told him there was no self, he'd be worried about what happened to the self he used to have. Better to just not say anything rather than the poor man get even more confused than he is already. And this was actually very wise on the Buddha's part because Bachigota kept coming back with questions. And eventually he decided to become a monk. And eventually he became fully awakened. And if the Buddha had said there was a self or there wasn't a self, he had just gotten more confused and maybe thought he had the answer and wouldn't keep coming back. So one with right view doesn't take a stand about whether there's a self or there's not a self. So when it, someone translate anatta as no self, they're not translating it in terms of what the Buddha said. Basically, he's saying, everywhere you look, that's not self. Right? But he never categorically said there was or wasn't a self. This idea of existence and non-existence, this is what we're after. This, we, we're really trying to pin down the universe into entities that exist or not exist. And the Buddha is saying it's more complex than that. It's more nuanced than that. It's more subtle than that. One with right view has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only dukkha arising and what ceases is only dukkha ceasing. Now, when I first heard that, it was like, what? I was thinking back to that chocolate cake. When that arose, that wasn't dukkha. Okay, I could see where the fact that chocolate cake is gone is now dukkha, but you know what's going on here? All that arises is dukkha arising. All that ceases is dukkha ceasing. It turns out there's two ways to interpret this. One way is to realize that when something arises and you give it existence, that's a mistake. That's going to lead to dukkha. And if something ceases and you think something is now non-existent, this is another mistake, and that can lead to dukkha. But the one I like better is to realize that maybe the best translation of dukkha is not a source of lasting happiness. One has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is not a lasting source of happiness. And what ceases is not a source of lasting happiness. That seems true. Since everything is impermanent, it's definitely not going to be a source of lasting happiness. And if it does go away, 
That just proved it wasn't a source of lasting happiness. Now, sometimes when something goes away, that's happiness. But there's no guarantee it's going to stay away or that something equally bad is not going to come. The world is changing all the time. There is no source of lasting happiness. When one understands this, one's knowledge about this is independent of others. That is, you don't need somebody telling you things exist or don't exist or both or neither or anything like that. You have experienced this for yourself. And so it doesn't matter what the other teachings are. In this way, there is right view. Everything exists, Kachiana. This is one extreme. Everything does not exist. This is the second extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, a Tathagata teaches the Dhamma via the middle. With this as necessary condition, that arises. With the ceasing of this necessary condition, that does not arise. Okay, so what the Buddha is basically saying, instead of thinking of existence and non-existence, Look at the world in terms of dependent origination. Things arise dependent on other things. Everything arises dependent on other things. Or the way I put it, there's nothing but soda pie. Streams of dependently arising processes interacting. Rather than things existing or not existing, there's just this huge ongoing dependently originating set of processes. That's it. Now, what I just told you is not exactly what the sutta says. The sutta actually says everything exists is one extreme, nothing exists is the other extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, a Tathagata teaches the Dhamma via the middle. With ignorance as condition, Sankaras come to be. With Sankaras as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, blah, 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 all the way up to with birth as condition, old age, sickness, death, pain, sorrow, grief, lamentation, despair, and all the rest of the dukkha comes to be. But with the fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of Sankaras. With cessation of Sankaras, cessation of consciousness. With cessation of consciousness, dot, 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 dot. With the cessation of birth comes the cessation of old age, sickness, death, pain, sorrow, grief, lamentation, despair, and the rest of the dukkha. Now, when I read this sutta, it was like, what are the 12 links doing here? Why are they here? They, they, they actually don't seem to address what the Buddha is talking about. I mean, why didn't he just say dependent origination? Or, itapataya chapa teaches amapada, or this, that conditionality. And then somebody sent me a copy of a translation of the Chinese version of this sutta. Are all of you aware that many suttas, most suttas, it's not just the Pali version, but there's also a Chinese version. And the Chinese version of the sutta says, one extreme is everything exists. The other extreme is nothing exists. Without veering towards either of these extremes, a Tathagata teaches the Dhamma via the middle. With this is necessary condition that arises. If this necessary condition doesn't happen, that does not arise. And then it's got all the 12 links. So it just seemed to me that, yeah, maybe that it just had something like Idapataya Japa teaches Samapada there. And then I was reading a very interesting book it's called Studies in the Origins of Buddhism by Govind C. Pandi. You can actually find a copy of this book in PDF form on the internet and download it for yourself. However, the PDF is just, you know, photographs of the pages. It's not actually searchable. And it's, it's a book that badly needs an editor. But it was interesting. He goes through the suttas and says, you know, what suttas he thinks are early, what suttas he thinks are late, and which ones are composites of early and late material, and which ones we don't know. 
And of course, the we don't know category is the big category. But it's, it's interesting to look at from a Sutta archaeological perspective. And so I'm looking, reading through the stuff in the Samyutta book 12, where the Sutta comes from. This is Samyutta 1215. And he says, yeah, some of these suttas in here appear to be tampered with at the end. There, would, there was something simpler there, like Idapataya Chapatichya Samapada, and they substituted the 12 links. And I'm like, yes, yes, he agrees with me. So that seems to be what's going on. So the, the sutta basically is, says, don't look at the world in terms of existence. Don't look at the world in terms of non-existence. Look at the world as nothing but a bunch of dependently arising processes interacting. That's all that's going on. This gives you a different perspective and it may give you some hints as to how to deal with the world. Because once you're looking at the world like that, you're no longer expecting to find lasting happiness in anything because the whole thinginess of the universe just isn't there anymore. Now, the person that turned me on to this sutta was a fellow by the name of Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna lived in the second century AD. So yeah, 500 years after the Buddha. It says that he was born to a Brahmin family in South India and excelled at the Brahmin studies. He was considered a scholar by the time he was 20, but he still had a sensuous side and he and three friends learned from a sorcerer how to make themselves invisible. And they went sneaking into the king's harem quarters where they um, entertained the ladies. Uh, when the king found out about this, he was rather upset. So he stationed soldiers behind the curtains and told them, strike above the footprints in the carpet. When Nagarjuna and his three friends snuck back into the harem quarters, his three friends were killed. Nagarjuna was only able to escape by standing next to the king. He fled the palace and headed for the hills. He had discovered craving can lead to dukkha. He began studying the teachings of the Buddha. And it says in three months, he had completely mastered the early teachings. But he was still curious. He had some questions. It was at that point that he encountered a Mahayana monk. The Mahayana tradition was just starting at that point. It was a newly emergent form of Buddhism. And Nagarjuna was quite impressed by what this Mahayana monk had to teach. So he left his mountain hideaway and went seeking more Mahayana teachings. He took on all comers in debate and defeated everyone. He eventually founded an order and rules for his monks to live by. At one point, he said, I have no master. This was when some Nagas, now Nagas are like mythical sea serpents, except they live in lakes. So mythical lake serpents, they play the role of dragons in Indian mythology. These Nagas came to Nagarjuna and took him to the bed of a lake where the Buddha's Prajma Paramita Sutras had been preserved. These are discussions between the Buddha and some of his leading disciples on emptiness. But they were considered too advanced for the people of the Buddha's time, so they were entrusted to the Nagas. And now the Nagas thought there was someone around who could actually present these teachings. And so they gave them to Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna came back to the human realm and composed various commentaries on the Prajma Paramita Sutras, commentaries on emptiness. The most famous one being 
the Mulama Yamaka Karika, the fundamental verses on the middle way. At some point, a king arranged for a contest of magic between Nagarjuna and a Brahmin scholar. The Brahmin created a giant lotus pond with a giant lotus in the middle with himself sitting on the lotus and mocked Nagarjuna for being stranded on dry land. Nagarjuna conjured up a white elephant which waded into the lotus pond, grabbed the Brahmin with its trunk and tossed him back on dry land. The Brahmin admitted defeat, but wished that Nagarjuna was dead. Nagarjuna locked himself in his room. The next day, a worried disciple broke down the door. A cicada flew out. The room was empty. Yeah, that's the story, right? That's the official biography of Nagarjuna. What we can really say that is that whoever wrote the Mulama Yamaka Karika, yeah, they were pretty brilliant. The Mulama Yamaka Karika is not a polished essay or treaty or book or anything like that. It appears to be more like debate notes. <clears throat> and there, there's 27 topics. And what Nagarjuna is doing in these is disclosing emptiness, pointing to it, like the finger pointing at the moon, trying to get you what a sense of emptiness is. Whether he wrote all the other things attributed to him or not, we don't know. But whoever did write the Mulama Yamaka Karika, yeah, let's call him Nagarjuna, and he was definitely a really brilliant person. So what I want to do is share with you some of the verses from the middle way, or the verses from the center is how Stephen Batchelor translates it. He has a book called The Verses from the Center, which is a quite good translation of the Mulama Yamaka Karika. And so uh, we're going to take a look at that. One of the first of these 27 topics is walking. I do not walk between the step already taken and the one I'm yet to take, which both are motionless. Is walking not the motion between one step and the next? What moves between them? Could I not move as I walk? If I move when I walk, there would be two motions, one moving me and one my feet. Two of us stroll by. There is no walking without walkers and no walkers without walking. Can I say that walkers walk? Couldn't I say they don't? Walking does not start in steps taken or to come or in the act itself. Where does it begin? Before I raise a foot, is there motion, a step taken or to come, whence walking could begin? What has gone? What moves? What is to come? Can I speak of walkers when neither walking, steps taken, nor to come ever end? Were walking and walker one, I would be unable to tell them apart. Were they different, there would be walkers who do not walk. These moving feet reveal a walker, but did not start him on his way. There was no walker prior to departure. Who was going where? So the concept of a walker and the concept of walking are very much interrelated. You can't have one without the other, but neither of them stands alone and they're both together and they're not the same. You know the difference between a walker and the act of walking. So they're, well, they're mutually dependent. This is dependent origination. Where walking and walker one 
I would be unable to tell them apart. Were they different, there would be walkers who do not walk. So the relationship between walkers and walking isn't that they're separate. It isn't that they're the same thing. They're in a mutual relationship there. And each of them is empty of essence. Because if something had an essence, it wouldn't be dependent on something else. That's what it means to have an essence. It's, yeah, it's all there in and of itself. But the walker depends upon the walking and the walking depends upon the walker. And they're not the same thing. Seeing. If my eyes cannot see themselves, how can they see something else? Were there no trace of something seen, how could I see it all? Neither seeing nor unseeing see. Seeing reveals a seer who is neither detached nor undetached from seeing. How could you see and what would you see in the absence of a seer? Just as a child is born from mother and father, so consciousness springs from eyes and colorful shapes. Without these eyes, how could I know consciousness, contact, vedna, craving, clinging, becoming, birth, aging, and death? Seers seeing sights explain hearers hearing sounds, smellers smelling smells, tasters tasting taste, touchers touching textures, Thinkers thinking thoughts. Again, seeing reveals a seer who is neither detached nor undetached from seeing. There's again this mutual relationship. But one thing that's interesting, your eyes can't see themselves. I mean, you can see your eyes reflection in a mirror but you're only seeing a reflection. You're not actually seeing your own eye. And you can't hear your ear. And you can't smell your nose. You can't taste your tongue. But you're thinking, yeah, but I can touch my body. But you can't touch a part of your body with that part of your body. You want to touch the tip of your finger with the tip of your finger? No, you, you got to use another finger or something. And then you're thinking, yeah, but I can think my thoughts. But when you think about a thought you're thinking, that's a different thought from the thought you just thunk. All of these are dependent on other things. None of this is standing alone. There's this huge amount of interdependence going on. Seeing doesn't exist by itself. It doesn't not exist either. It depends on a seer who doesn't exist by him or herself and doesn't not exist. Body. I have no body apart from the parts which form it. I know no part apart from a body. A body with no parts would be unformed. A part of my body apart from my body would be absurd. Were the body here or not, it would need no parts. Partless bodies are pointless. Do not get stuck in the body. I cannot say my body is like its parts. I cannot say it's something else. Vedna, perceptions, sankharas, minds, things are like this body in every way. Conflict with emptiness is no conflicts. Objection to emptiness, no objections. Your body is made up of parts. But what if you lose part of your body? I mean, you go to get a haircut. You come in, the hair is part of you, right? And you get a haircut and then you look at the floor and it's like, oh no, part of me is on the floor, right? You do that every time, I bet, right? No, no. Or you clip your fingernails, right? It's your fingernail, and then part of you is in the garbage, right? Suppose you were to lose some 
vital part of your body. That's nah, too gross. Let's let's take your red Corvette. You, I'm sure you all have a red Corvette. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. <clears throat> we take your red Corvette and we take off one of the wheels. Is it still a red Corvette? What if we take off all four wheels? Is it still a red Corvette? What if we take out the steering wheel? What if we remove the seats? What if we pull the engine and take all the pieces apart? What if we drop the transmission and do the same thing? What if we take everything apart, unscrew everything that can be unscrewed, unbolt everything that can be unbolted until there's nothing but a pile of parts? Where did your red Corvette go? At what point did it stop being a red Corvette and become a pile of parts? Was there really a red Corvette there in the first place? Or was it just a pile of parts that happened to be piled up in a way that enabled you to drive 85 miles an hour down the freeway? There was no essence to your red Corvette. When you took it all apart, it was just a bunch of parts. We're like that in every way. We're just a bunch of parts. I suggest not disconnecting all the parts and laying them out there, but that's an interesting thing that if you do it in your imagination, there's just parts here, but they're not me unless it's all connected together. So my body doesn't exist independent of its parts. And the parts aren't part of my body unless they're attached to my body. There's all this relationship, all this dependencies here. The next one I want to take a look at is entitled Self. Where mind and matter me, I would come and go like them. If I were something else, they would say nothing about me. What is mine when there is no me? Were self-centeredness eased, I would not think of me and mine. There would be no one there to think them. What is inside is me, what is outside is mine. When these thoughts end, compulsion stops, repetition ceases, freedom dawns. Fixation spawn thoughts that provoke compulsive acts. Emptiness stops fixations. Buddhists speak of self and also teach no self and also say there's nothing which is either self or not. When things dissolve, there's nothing left to say. The unborn and unceasing are already free. The Buddha said it is real and it is unreal and it is both real and unreal and it is neither one nor the other. It is all at ease, unfixable by fixations, incommunicable, inconceivable, indivisible. You are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither severed from nor forever fused with them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. When Buddhas don't appear and their followers are gone, the wisdom of awakening bursts forth by itself. This one's probably worth rereading. Were mind and matter me, I would come and go like them. You change out all the cells of your body every seven years. Some of them you change a lot faster. You don't have a single cell left in your body from 20 years ago. They've just all been changed out. Yeah, you might be a different person, but that different? And your mind, how often do you change your mind, right? They come, your body and mind are coming and going all the time. And yet you think, yeah, it's me. It's still me around here. But if you were something else, then mind and matter wouldn't say anything about you. Again, this dependency, interdependency. What is mine when there is no me? 
if there's no concept of me, there's no concept of an owner to claim mine. Were self-centeredness self -centeredness eased, I would not think of me and mine. There would be no one there to think them. Right now, we're operating from the delusion of a self. Yeah, me. I mean, it's me. It's not you. You guys are all someplace else. It's got to be me. But it's an illusion. And when you make your decisions based on an illusion, you might just not make the best decisions. For example, let's say you go to the beach and you look out and you can see the edge of the world. It's six miles out, actually. You see a ship get too close to it and it just goes over the edge. I mean, I've seen this happen a lot of times. You know, I go to Ocean Beach in San Francisco and I see some big old ship and they just get too near the edge and they just go right over and fall off the edge of the world. It's tragic. It happens so regularly. Why don't they understand? My friend says to me, I got a sailboat. Let's sail down to LA. I'm like, no way, man. We get six miles out. We fall off the edge of the world. I'm making a decision based on an illusion. Now, let's say they come along, they grab me, they stick me in a, a Falcon rocket on top of a Falcon rocket. They blast me off to the International Space Station. They take me up into the cupola. They look down and say, see, it's a sphere. They explain gravity to me. I come back. I go back to Ocean Beach. I look out there. It looks just like it did before. But now when a ship gets near the edge, I don't think it fell off the edge. I just know it sailed beyond the horizon. My friend might say to me, I got a sailboat, let's sail down to LA. I might still turn him down because I get seasick, right? But I'm not going to worry about falling off the edge of the world. I'm not going to be making a decision based on the illusion of the edge of the world. Well, we go around with this illusion of self and we make all sorts of self-centered decisions on it. What is mine when there is no me? Were self-centeredness eased, I would not think of me and mine. There would be no one there to think them. What is inside is me. What is outside is mine. When these thoughts end, compulsion stops, repetition ceases, freedom dawns. We, we need to break through this illusion of a separate self. Come to terms with the fact, yeah, it's nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting. Fixation spawn thoughts that provoke compulsive acts. Emptiness stops fixations. Fixations is Stevens Bachelor's translation of papancha. A better translation would be mental proliferation. So mental proliferation spawns thoughts that provoke compulsive acts. Emptiness stops mental proliferation. Papancha is a really great word. I mean, we get caught up in it so easy. We get a sense contact. It produces a Vedna. We conceptualize what's going on. And then we start thinking and emoting and dreaming and planning and everything. We got lost in our papancha. And we start making up the whole world. So Papancha spawns thoughts that provoke compulsive acts. There's a story about the man whose wife asks him to go to the market and get some potatoes. Yes, dear. So he gets up, gets ready to go. And as he goes out the door, she says, and be sure and get a good price. Yes, dear. So he's walking to the market and he's thinking, got to watch out for those potato sellers. She wants me to get a good price, but she also wants good potatoes. Pretty easy to get bad potatoes for a good price. Hard to get good potatoes for a good price. You got to watch those potato sellers. They'll put good potatoes on top and bad potatoes on the bottom. Sometimes there's a rotten potato in there. I hate the smell of rotten potatoes. At that moment, he arrives at the potato seller and screams at him, you can keep your rotten potatoes and walks off. Papancha. 
we just get going with some crazy idea and off we go. Emptiness stops Papancha. When we can realize what's actually going on, we won't get so lost in all of our mental machinations. Buddhists speak of self and also teach not self and also say there's nothing which is either self or not. So sometimes the Buddha talked about selves. When he's talking about metta, he says that you should send metta to all as to yourself. Selves there, ones you're sending to and you. Also teach not self. We had that this morning, right? Bhikkhus is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, sir. What is impermanent, sukha or dukkha? Dukkha, venerable, sir. Is what is impermanent, dukkha, and subject to change fit to be regarded as yourself? No, venerable, sir. That's a teaching of not self. And they also say there's nothing which is either self or not. That's what we had in the Kachyanagota Sutta that we started tonight with. Don't think of selves existing. Don't think of selves not existing. Just see that there's dependently originating processes rolling on. When things dissolve, there's nothing left to say. The unborn and unceasing are already free. When the thinginess of the world disappears, then things don't arise. They're not born. And when things don't arise, they don't cease either. This is where freedom is when you can just experience the world as nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting. The Buddha said it is real and it is unreal and it is both real and unreal and it's neither one nor the other. Depending upon to whom the Buddha was talking, he said one thing or another. He wasn't doing consistent metaphysics. People want non-contradictory teachings. But the Buddha was just trying to get people to practice. So if a Jain came to him and wanted some advice, he might say exactly the opposite of what he would say to a Brahmin. And he would say different things to a layman than what he would say to the monks. He's just trying to get people to practice. He's not doing metaphysics. He's not trying to describe how the whole world is. You say, look, man, it's all just dependently originated. Go practice. It's all at ease, unfixable by fixations. No amount of papancha is going to get it all resolved. We had that early on. You can't hammer it out with reason. You're going to have to experience. It's all at ease. It's incommunicable, inconceivable, indivisible. The problem with the ultimate view of reality, which is what we're talking about here, there are no words in the ultimate realm because words are, well, they're relative concepts. They're bits of sanya. So it's difficult to communicate about all that can be done is point at it. And you just hope that when you're pointing at it, people don't start examining your fingernail or your jewelry on your finger or whatever, that they actually follow what's there. It's inconceivable. You cannot conceptualize ultimate reality. It's bigger than our little pea brains can take in. We can get some ideas that help us point in that direction, but it's bigger than a concept and it's indivisible. There is no piece of reality that's separate from reality. We chop the world up into bits and pieces because our little pea brains can't take it all in. You see something, you need to chop it up into, okay, this thing I deal with, this I ignore, and that I've got to be afraid of, or whatever it is that's going on. And to be able to handle the environment in which we find ourselves embedded, since we can't take the whole thing in and deal with it, we take in bits and pieces, make them into things, give them desirable or undesirable qualities, give it a name. 
but actually there's just streams of dependently arising processes rolling on. And then what comes is to me one of the most profound things I've read in any spiritual literature anywhere. You are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither severed from nor forever fused with them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. I don't know what you had for supper. Let's say you had a salad. You're not the same as that lettuce, but you're not different from it either. It's not there forever, but it's, you're not going to see it as salad. I mean, it changed you and it's different. You are not the same as or different from the conditions on which you depend. Those conditions, that's the streams coming at you. Some of them was the salad you had for supper, right? Some of it's the education you had. Some of it's your family of origin. Some of it's just the fact that you're a human being. You're not the same as those, nor are you different from those. You're neither severed from them nor forever fused with them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. This is, this is what led to Soda Pai, this teaching right here, and a few other things thrown in. But this was the big, the big hit I got. And then when Buddhas don't appear and their followers are gone, the wisdom of awakening bursts forth by itself. The truth is out there. All you've got to do is look and see. The Buddha didn't make the truth appear. He just described the truth that's out there. The Buddha's followers, they're just telling you what the Buddha said. They're saying, look over there. You don't need that. You can do this on your own. But it's really, really hard. Buddhas don't come along very often. People who discover that for this for themselves are very rare. So personally, I'm really, really happy the Buddha pointed this out. Because if I'd had to figure it out on my own, not a chance. Not a chance. So I want to take a look at one more. This one, Bachelor calls awakening. But uh, I would call it the Four Noble Truths. That's usually what the title is. It starts with an opponent giving Nagarjuna what for, for teaching the wrong doctrine. If everything is empty, there would be no rising and passing. Ennobling truths would not exist. There would be no understanding, letting go, cultivation, realizing. Without tasting the fruits of practice, there would be no Sangha. With no truths, no Dharma either. With no Sangha and Dharma, how could you awaken? Talk of emptiness maligns what's of value. Acts and fruits, good and evil, conventions fall apart. So this opponent has misunderstood emptiness to, for non-existence. He thinks that when Nagarjuna says things are empty, he's saying they don't exist. Nagarjuna replies, not knowing emptiness, the need for it, or the point of it, you subvert it. The Dharma taught by Buddhas hinges on two truths, partial truths of the world and truths which are sublime. Without knowing how they differ, you cannot know the deep. Without relying on conventions, you cannot disclose the sublime. Without intuiting the sublime, you cannot experience freedom. This is the two truths. The Dharma taught by Buddhas hinges on two truths. Partial truths of the world. Actually, it literally says truths that don't fully reveal. So when I hold this up and say, this is my phone, it's true, it's not your phone, right? And it is a phone, but it doesn't fully reveal what's going on here. It doesn't fully reveal the silicon and the plastic and the programming and the glass 
and all the other stuff that's part of the phone. It doesn't reveal the streams of dependently arising processes that have intersected in this little rectangle so that I can call it a phone. So that's the partial truths of the world and truths which are sublime, truths that are inconceivable, indivisible, incommunicatable. Without knowing how these two truths differ, you cannot know the deep. Sometimes when people get a first taste of not self, the question arises like with this monk, all right, if there's not a self there, who gets the results of the karma, right? So they're looking at the not self, which is an ultimate truth. And then they're asking a who question, which is a relative question. It just doesn't work like that. Without knowing how they differ, you cannot know the deep. You've got to know which questions belong to which realm so you don't go asking silly questions. Without relying on conventions, you cannot disclose the sublime. So Nagarjuna is trying to disclose the sublime, but he's got to use words. That's a convention. Sentences, ideas. He's putting them out there and hoping that instead of getting lost at looking at his finger, you actually follow it to see the sublime because without intuiting the sublime, you cannot experience freedom. I prefer to talk about two perspectives rather than two truths. The truths are seen from two different perspectives. So this is a glass. Now, is this glass concave or convex? Well, which is it? Those are opposites. Is this glass concave or is it convex? Well, it depends on your perspective. Concave or convex? Which is it? These are opposites. Come on. You, you ought to be able to tell me it's one or the other, right? Well, it depends on your perspective. If I want to put something in this, I better take the concave perspective. If I want to put something on top of it, maybe a tea candle that's not sitting on the table, I put it this way, use the convex perspective. These things are opposite. They're just concepts. You can have opposite concepts in the same thing. This applies to reality. There are two different perspectives on whether the glass is concave or convex, whether the lid of that little jar is concave or convex. Depends on your perspective. It's the same with reality. There are two perspectives. One of them doesn't fully reveal what's going on. It does reveal this is my phone, but it won't set me free. You need to be able to take the ultimate perspective as well. But crossing the street, you better take the relative perspective. Because if you take the concave perspective and step in front of a bus, if you take the ultimate perspective and step in front of the bus, no, it doesn't work. So you need to know about the two perspectives and the truths that can be seen from both of these perspectives and realize that neither one is better than the other, but that you need both of them and you need the ultimate perspective to experience freedom. This perceiving emptiness injures the unintelligent like mishandling a snake or miscasting a spell. You could see where Nagarjan is hard on people that he disagrees with. The Buddha despaired of teaching the Dharma, knowing it hard to intuit its depths. Your muddled conclusions do not affect emptiness. Your denial of emptiness does not affect me. Mr. Opponent, you certainly have a lot of dust in your eyes, is what Nagarjuna is saying. When emptiness is possible, everything is possible. 
Were emptiness impossible, nothing would be possible. So here, Nagar just pointing out that if things had an essence, they wouldn't change. They would essentially be the same thing forever. And if things aren't changing, then, well, you're just stuck with it like it is. In projecting your faults onto me, you forget the horse you are riding. So this is a story about a man who had two dozen horses. And one morning he saddles up on one of the horses and rides out to count his horses. One, two, three, two, 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 22, 23. Oh no, one of my horses is missing, forgetting to count the horse he's riding. To see things existing by nature is to see them without causes or conditions. If something has an essence, then it's always had an essence. It's been there all along. The essence is permanent. And so it couldn't have been caused it, it, because it was always there. When you see things existing by nature, you subvert causality, agents, tools, and acts, starting, stopping, and ripening. Dependent origination is emptiness, which dependently configured is the middle way. Everything is dependently originated. Everything is empty. So Nagarjuna is equating emptiness and dependent origination. Things are empty because they're dependently originated. And it's not brought out in this translation when he says empty, can, dependent origination is emptiness, which dependently configured is the middle way. What he's saying is emptiness is also empty. It's just another concept. It's a helpful concept, hopefully, but don't go making a big deal about emptiness. In another one of these, he says, believers in emptiness are incurable. It's just a useful concept. Everything is empty. This particular one goes on. I'm going to skip it and move on to just one line from the next one. This is a famous samsara is no different from nirvana. Nirvana no different than samsara. Samsara's horizons are nirvana's horizons. The two are exactly the same. This right here is samsara, if you look at it with the eyes of craving and clinging. This, right here, is nirvana, if you look at it with the eyes of a Buddha. There isn't a nirvana someplace else. It's not a heaven where fully enlightened beings go when they die. It's right here, right now, if you can stop the craving and clinging, if you can look at the world from such a way that the craving and clinging doesn't arise. And examining the world and seeing its empty nature is something that can be very useful for you doing that. So it's with a fair amount of trepidation, I say. Any questions? <laughs>